Unfortunately, you find genetically modified foods everywhere and the quality of the food is going down and down every day. And this has caused different types of sicknesses to arise just because of a terrible diet. And the most common one you see is diabetes. When you eat anything that has carbohydrates, like bread, rice, potatoes, and of course, a lot of foods that have sugar in it, that's all gonna go into your stomach and start digesting. When your stomach burns carbohydrates, it turns it into glucose. And glucose is a type of sugar. You can't say glucose is bad for you because your body needs it to produce energy. So alongside carbohydrates, different types of sweets, and of course, fruits are gonna give you this glucose. When you produce glucose, it inserts your bloodstream and that's when your body realizes that you have a lot of glucose in your blood. Basically means your sugar is going up. After realizing this, this is when the pancreas is called in action. Pancreas sits underneath the stomach and it produces a hormone called insulin. And when it's called to do something, it produces it and enters the bloodstream. But what does insulin do? Long story short, the insulin enters the blood and turns the glucose in your body into energy. But how exactly does it turn it into energy? The simplest way we could put it is that glucose goes next to muscle cells, but they cannot get in because it's locked. This is when the insulin has to come, insert the key and open up the cell so the glucose can enter and turn into energy. This process we just explained causes the glucose levels to go down in your blood and your energy levels up. And this happens in a healthy body. Your body is comfortable when the optimum level of glucose and insulin are medium and it's never too high or too low. And if one of these is up or down, this is when there's something wrong with the body. The percent of your glucose and insulin in your blood has a lot to do with your diet, how much you move around, and of course, your genetic makeup. So long story short, if there's an imbalance between these two things, that's gonna cause diabetes. But it's more complicated than this because there's two types of diabetes, diabetes type one and type two. In the type one diabetes, which is usually genetic, that's when your pancreas does not work whatsoever. So there is a lack of insulin in your bloodstream all the time. Type 1 diabetes is also much rarer, On only 10% of diabetes patients have it. In a body that's suffering from type 1 diabetes, they can eat, it turns into glucose and enters the bloodstream, and it goes towards the muscle to turn into energy. But there is no insulin to open the door for it to enter the muscle, so it just hangs around. This is when the glucose have nothing to do. And the longer you continue to do this, the more glucose is building up inside the bloodstream. This is when the body is misfiring and it has to get rid of all that glucose in the system. So it chooses the kidney. It basically gets filtered out of there and you urine it out. This is why when a type one diabetes patient does not get medical help, they continually go to the bathroom to urinate. When you urinate this much, of course, most of your body's water is going to the bathroom. That's why you get extremely thirsty. But even with all that, your urine is not able to eliminate all the glucose in your body. It continues to build up and turn into bacteria. This bacteria causes a lot of problems. One of those, is that your cuts and bruises are gonna take much longer to heal. The bacteria that builds up because of too much glucose can cause a lot of problems. One of those problems is that it builds up around the eye and it causes to get cloudy. And in a way, they turn into a legally blind person. When all this is happening, the person feels extremely tired because there's no glucose turning into energy. Since there's a lack of energy, you start burning your own fat. You might say that's good, you're gonna get skinnier, but this is not a healthy way to lose fat. And this causes you to lose energy day by day. The situation we're explaining to you is a person that has type one diabetes and does not have access to a doctor or does not want to go to the doctor and they're living with this misery. Because if they go to the doctor, they would be prescribed medication and especially insulin and most of their problems will go away and they could maintain a healthy life. Since we know what type one diabetes was, let's see what type two is. Only 
90% of diabetes patients are type 1. So 90% of diabetes patients are type 2. This does not happen usually because of genetics. It usually happens because of the diet and lack of exercise. You usually see type 2 diabetes after the age of 40. And most of the time is white people or South Asians. If you've seen South Asians, you see that they're very skinny usually. But this does not mean a person that's skinny does not get type 2 diabetes. In a type 2 diabetes body, there is either a lack of insulin or the pancreas is not working correctly. When does insulin not work properly? When there's too much fat buildup inside your system. And this is why when people are overweight, they have a higher chance of getting diabetes. Insulin is the key to your muscle cells and they open it up for the glucose. But when there's too much fat in your system, they built up around the keyhole and the insulin cannot insert the key to open the lock, which is why the glucose continues to build up in your blood and it does not enter your muscle cells. So the glucose continues to rise up in your blood system and it has nowhere to go. Or in simple terms, your blood sugar is rising. After this stage, this is when your type 2 diabetes gets extremely complicated. In this situation, your body thinks there's a lack of insulin because it does not feel the energy. And that's when your pancreas starts to overproduce insulin. And what is happening now? Both of your glucose and insulin levels are rising, but nothing correct is being done. The complications does not stop there. Your muscle cells lack energy, so they send a message to your liver that has plenty of glucose because they think there's a lack of glucose in your blood. And your liver starts pumping glucose in your blood, which rises your blood sugar even more. But unfortunately, there's too much glucose in your blood and this is only causing harm than good. As you can see, everything is messing up and the RPMs of your pancreas are rising and they're reaching red line. And in simple terms, this is when your pancreas gives up and burns out and it does not produce insulin anymore. Most of the problems you saw in type 1 diabetes, now you will see it in type 2 diabetes. Your eyes could take damage and be blurry, get extremely thirsty, lack of energy, you're losing fat in a terrible way, urinate a lot, and cuts and bruises that take a very long time to heal. The problem with type 2 diabetes, unlike type 1, is that it takes a very long time to show itself. And there has been people that live with type 2 diabetes four, five, six, up to 10 years without noticing it. So what can the doctor do? It very much matters what stage of diabetes the patient is. If it hasn't caused too much damage, even with some exercise, it could help out. But most people that realize they have type 2 diabetes, it's kind of too late, which is why the doctor can help with this and they will prescribe medication and sometimes insulin. And we're not gonna name any type of medication because it's up to the doctor what to prescribe to what person. The best way not to get diabetes is to keep a healthy lifestyle, keep a healthy weight, don't eat junk food, and of course exercise. There are people that eat junk food and fast food all day and they don't get fat. But this does not mean you have a healthy body. Eating a thousand calories of fast food versus eating a thousand calories of healthy food that you made home with high quality products, it's very much different because the low quality will cause a lot of damage. And also the low quality food like McDonald's or any other fast food is so low quality that they make it taste better with salt, sugar, and MSG. And this is why you see skinny people with diabetes as well. Of course, try to avoid drinks like sodas and juices because they have a lot of sugar and it's sugar you don't really taste when you're drinking it. And another thing I wanted to tell you about is the keto diet. This does not help with diabetes whatsoever, but it is a quick way to lose some weight. You don't eat carbs like rice and bread, and you eat mostly chicken, beef, fats, and other types of products. It's going to be hard, but it helps if you do it for a couple months. There are people that do low carbs as well, where they don't eat as much bread and rice. This doesn't have anything to do with diabetes, but I just wanted to let you guys know. Throughout history, three different diseases ruled the world. One is of course the Black Death. The runner up is smallpox. And last but not least, syphilis.
Syphilis is a type of disease that can make a person go crazy. If you've seen our clip about Al Capone, this is how he died at the end of his life. Nearing the age of 48, he basically couldn't even move, so he was basically paralyzed. Nowadays, with the help of antibiotics, you can get rid of this disease. But for most of history, it wasn't this easy. When someone had syphilis, they had it for life. Nowadays, each year, more than 6 million people get infected with syphilis. And if they have access to things like penicillin, they can easily get rid of it. But since back in the day, they couldn't do anything about it, it was known as a terrifying disease. Nobody really knows where syphilis came from, but the first time it was written about, it was in the 15th century in Europe. And the first case it was written about is that prostitutes have this type of disease and you should stay away from them. So from early on, syphilis was known as a disgusting type of disease where not only was it terrible, but when people actually had it, they were embarrassed of it and they didn't want anyone to know about it. It's at the same time where Europeans are setting sail to America to find more gold and treasures. And one of the first gifts they bring to the Native Americans is smallpox and syphilis. A lot of historians believe that more than half of the Native American population from the north all the way to the south of America died of smallpox and it was all because of the Europeans. At least the Asians, the Africans and the Europeans knew how to fight with this disease longer than anyone else. Which is why when Native Americans contacted smallpox and even syphilis, they died much easier because their body had never seen something like this for thousands of years. Nobody knows the exact number of Native Americans that died from smallpox and syphilis. But all we know is that their body could not fight off this disease like the Europeans and the Asians and the Africans. Because they've been dealing with it for a very long time while the Native Americans have just contacted it. So their body couldn't even fight with it and it would just fail. The natives would die in groups and the Europeans kept finding gold and taking it back to Europe. But let's get back to syphilis itself and get to know the sickness a little bit better. The bacteria that creates this disease is called Treponema pallidum or T. pallidum. The bacteria itself looks like a spiral type of worm, but of course you can't see it with the naked eye and it could only be seen under a microscope. The T. pallidum bacteria can only live in certain areas. It has to live inside a body. If it's outside, somewhere like on a surface, it will only last about two hours, so it likes to stay in a human body as long as possible. It's also extremely difficult to keep this bacteria alive inside the laboratory to do more research on it. It's also good to know it's not like the common cold or the COVID virus where you can spread it by sneezing everywhere. It can only be sexually transmitted. That's why it's called an SDD. But you have to know it could be transmitted with your mouth and also a cut but the cut version is much rarer than the sexually transmitted ones. All right, let's say the bacteria entered the human body. What is it going to do? Just like most dangerous bacteria, it first shows itself with a fever and inflammation somewhere on the body. At this time, your body starts to fight off the bacteria and after a while, it seems like it's all good and the bacteria is done. But this is where the bacteria is fooling your white blood cells and your whole entire army because the bacteria has turned invisible. It hasn't literally turned invisible, it actually changed the proteins on the sides of it. So the white blood cells cannot even detect it anymore. It thinks this bacteria belongs inside the body, so it doesn't even try. When the T. pallidum bacteria realizes that it could stay low key, it starts reproducing and raising its population, aka army. After three weeks passes, this sickness comes back and the person gets fever and feels sick once again. This is now considered syphilis and the person is officially a patient. After the three weeks, you could also see where this bacteria entered the body because it's very infected and there's a large portion of this bacteria living there. And this is exactly where the bacteria entered. This could only be found in the mouth area, the genitalia 
or a cut which is much rarer than the other two. After three weeks, if you don't go see a doctor and get some help, the bacteria will continue living and expanding its life. But after the three weeks, it realizes that it's getting a little too sketchy and continues to change the way it looks. And after days and days, the way the bacteria looks differs from the other bacterias, but they are all T. pallidum, and this is all to throw off the white blood cells inside your body. The more time passes, the more bacteria you have, and the more space they're conquering. It will get to a point where they're in every part of your body. The power this bacteria has is that it continues to change the way it looks. And this is the reason why the human immune system has trouble fighting it off because they can't easily detect what's bad and what's good. So they just leave it be. The bacteria also doesn't stay in one spot only and continue growing there. It slowly grows and it takes over the entire body instead of staying in one area. After six weeks, if nothing is being done to the patient, we're gonna enter the phase called secondary syphilis. And this is when it's starting to get very sketchy. If you remember the first three weeks, you could see the area where the bacteria entered the human body, which was the tongue in our case. But after six weeks, that infected area is gonna turn to your entire body you will see infected cuts like that throughout your body and they're very painful. Alongside these infected cuts throughout the body, all your hair continues to fall. You experience quick weight loss, you have high fevers, and of course a lot of inflammation. You could say your immune system is the best army, so they continue to fight off this bacteria. But once again, the T. pallidum bacteria fools the human immune system. Your white blood cells think they defeated this bacteria, but it has gone invisible again and it's trying to enter the dormant stage. In the dormant stage, it's actually the most dangerous because this bacteria is going to be here for a while. Even though the infected cuts are no longer there and you feel fine, but this bacteria is inside you and it's growing day by day. When this bacteria enters the dormant stage, it's basically getting ready for a final fight and it wants to finish the job once and for all. After many years, you will finally reach the tertiary syphilis. At this stage, the bacteria focuses on the veins of a certain area and causes infection and inflammation. Anywhere that's chosen, you will see a swollen area outside the body. When a certain area of your veins gets infected, it causes your entire organ system to get damaged because not enough blood flow is getting to it. And when not enough blood gets to your lungs, that means the oxygen in your blood continues to get lower and lower. And this is where the real problems are just beginning. So in this case, the worst damage is being done to your brain and heart. Since the veins are getting infected, it's hard to continue pumping blood. And since there's not enough oxygen being pumped into the blood, your brain is struggling. Pretty much the worst thing you can do is give unoxygenated blood or blood with low oxygen to your neurons. Human neurons are so fragile that they will die if there's a lack of oxygen in the blood they're receiving. So this is when the case is very serious. After killing your brain cells because of a lack of oxygen, the owner of your body, which is your brain, cannot control it well anymore, so everything is struggling. The person can't even move their arms correctly or walk correctly. It even gets to a point where you can't even blink properly, something you and I can do without thinking. But when there is low oxygen in your brain, you can't even do it properly. You could say all hope is lost in your brain power and you start hallucinating and seeing things that are not real. Throughout history, when syphilis got to this case, they would say this person has gone mad or is now crazy, but they didn't realize it's actually the syphilis bacteria that's causing your body to have low oxygenated blood and your brain is failing. 
When this continues, the brain power gets less and less and it gets to a point where the human body is paralyzed. And after struggling for many months or maybe years, the person will die of a heart attack or a stroke. Syphilis is terrifying, but not in today's world. Back in the day, a patient would suffer for more than 10 years and die a painful death. But nowadays, all this could be resolved if you have antibiotics available to you. The quicker you detect this bacteria inside the body and the quicker you heal it, the less damage is done to the human body. But if damage has been done and you get rid of the bacteria, that damage is permanent now. It is because of these things that syphilis is known as a terrifying disease. I wish you all the very best. We've mentioned this plenty of times, but the human skeleton is truly a work of art. If you have healthy bones, you can easily sit down and get up, walk around, start running, or even jump. If you've seen our video about osteoporosis, you're very familiar with human skeleton, and you know that they could get sick in plenty of different ways. One of the most common ways the bone gets sick is between the joints. It is these joints that allow us to move around easily, bend our arms and legs, and obviously walk around. Alongside this, we have three different types of bones. There are immovable bones, like your skull, where you cannot move it. There are bones that slightly move and have some play, like your ribs. And then you have movable joints or free joints, because they can move however they want, kind of like your arms, legs, shoulders, and back. In this video, we mostly want to talk about free joints. Between these joints, you have a type of fluid called the synovial membrane or the synovial fluid. But what does this fluid do? This fluid is basically how you oil the hinges on your door to make it open and close smoothly. This liquid is basically doing that for your joints like your knees. Between this liquid, you also have another part between the bones called the cartilage. The main thing the cartilage does is that it mixes with this liquid and makes everything much smoother. Or in simple terms, it doesn't let bone interact with bone. It's kind of like the rod bearings in your engine. These bearings do not allow your rod to hit the crank. And if it does or it gets loose, you have something called rod knock and you have to rebuild the engine. <coughs> When you easily run, jump up and down, or even walk, it is because your bone is working together with the cartilage and the liquid that's called the synovial fluid. In a way, you could say this system is completely engineered in a human body and it allows us to move freely without feeling it. Also, your bone has play in it and makes this process even smoother. So until now, everything is going well. And since we got to know human joints, let's learn some bad things about it. The most common problem you can have with your joints is a problem called osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is another form of arthritis. Arthritis is just a generic term for all types of arthritis. And osteoarthritis is the most common one you can face. More than a hundred million people around the world have arthritis and are living with it. And more than 50% of them are women. And you could mostly find it above the age of 45. In simple terms, when someone has a form of arthritis, it's kind of like lacking oil in your joints and they can't move it freely and it's very stiff. And even if you try to move it, there's a lot of pain in that joint. The most places you can find the pain in arthritis is in your back, your fingers and hands, your knees and feet. But how does it begin? 
The problem always begins with the cartilage. It either begins to harden or it begins to deteriorate. And that's the main reason you mostly find arthritis in older people. But if you experience an injury or you're very much overweight, it could happen much earlier because all these could cause your cartilage to take damage. And that basically means arthritis. So what does the human body do to fight this problem? When the human body realizes that a part of the body is lacking cartilage and it's not working properly, it tries to repair it. And it's interesting to know, it is extremely rare, but sometimes it's successful in repairing the cartilage. But unfortunately, this is very rare because most of the time it does not successfully rebuild and in return, it actually damages it even more. Physicians say when your body tells your cartilage to repair itself, it does not rebuild cartilage. It actually replaces with hard bone and that causes the place to get even more awkward. It ruins the cartilage even more and that also causes inflammation to happen in that area, which causes even more pain. Also in this situation, the fluid that's supposed to oil everything does not have its effect anymore. Athletes that use one of their body parts a lot throughout their career will have this problem later in life. And if you don't move around or you're very much overweight, this will happen, especially to your lower body. It could also be genetics. So if you have it in your family, there might be a chance that you have it too. That's the reason why doctors say if you exercise, exercise all of your body, not just one part. Don't just go start doing pull-ups every single day. Switch it around sometime. You will see this in tennis players mainly because one of their dominant hands takes a lot of hit throughout the career. And later in life, that body part will have a lot of problems, especially arthritis types of problems. You have another type of arthritis called the rheumatoid arthritis, which is the second most common version. And it's good that it's a little bit rarer because it has a lot more problems than osteoarthritis. In this problem, not only will your joints take a lot of damage and have a lot of pain, body parts like your eye, lungs, kidneys, and even your skin. But why does a joint problem cause your body parts to have a problem? It's because your white blood cells, the cells that are supposed to protect you, make mistakes and attack the body instead. In this situation, the white blood cell basically sees the cartilage as its enemy, and that's why they basically attack it and destroy it even further. After this situation takes place, bone on bone will start sitting on each other, and this is when excruciating pain begins. Since your white blood cells are the enemy of the cartilage, they go to the rest of the body and destroy every other cartilage, even the cartilage around your eye socket, which is why people that have this type of arthritis have eye problems as well. Like for example, the eyes dry up all the time and they have to use eye drops, or they have a lot of eye pain, which turns them very much red. Unfortunately, if you have this type of arthritis, you will have it for the rest of your life. But good news is that there are a lot of help you can receive, especially in terms of medication. But of course, alongside this medication, you could do a lot of therapies like physical therapy to help you out as well. And if you do this all together, you can have a normal life. Sometimes if the problem is very much intense, they will even consider replacing that joint with an artificial one. Just like we said, the most common arthritis you can get is osteoarthritis. And just like any other arthritis, there's no real cure for it. But there are a lot of treatments that make it seem like you don't really have it. The last one we want to introduce to you guys is called gout, which is also another form of arthritis. Between these three, gout is very much different because it attacks and it's called a gout attack and it usually goes for your big toe. Some people say when the gout attack happens, it seems like someone is smashing your toe with a hammer. And the worst part is it happens late at night while you're sleeping. But this doesn't mean it could only be found in your big toe. It is still a form of arthritis and it could attack any other joint. These are the body parts that you could see gout attacking. But what happens for a gout attack to happen? 
If you have too much uric acid inside your blood, it causes uric acid crystals to form and they pile up around a joint, which is usually your big toe. But where does acid uric come from? You have to know that our cells are always getting recycled. A lot of them die, but a lot of them gets replaced. But there is a waste that's left behind and that's uric acid. They're supposed to get filtered out with the kidneys and you have to urinate it out. One of the problems that could make your uric acid rise in your blood system is your kidney not working properly to eliminate the uric acid. Or in simple terms, it doesn't filter it out properly. But it's not always the kidney's fault. It could be a side effect of a medication, you could use too much drugs, or even alcohol. Also, this could be seen in lead poisoning as well. And there are some people that if they eat too much red meat, it causes their uric acid to rise and that causes a gout attack. Unlike other forms of arthritis, gout is usually found in men above the age of 40. But just like we said, depending on your genetics and diet or the way you live life, it could cause you to have gout at an early age as well, especially for people that are overweight, have a terrible diet, high blood pressure, or diabetes. For a doctor to detect gout, they have to inspect your joints because a simple blood test that shows a lot of uric acid in your blood is not enough data. Just like other forms of arthritis, there is no real cure for gout. But, just like we said, there is a lot of treatments you could use. So in this video, we got familiar with three forms of arthritis. The most common one, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout. If you have any other information about different types of arthritis, please leave it in the comments so we can all learn more about it. There is a very serious illness and even though it's not that common, it affects a lot of people's lives and you can find it in each part of the world. Multiple Escalerosis or MS. We can say that MS is a very serious and complicated disorder because it completely affects the nervous system. The human nervous system is probably the most complicated thing we know of and it's the wiring harness of our entire body and if something acts up, everything acts up. And since it's so complicated when MS takes place, it has a lot of symptoms. Like for example, your eyes can lose vision, it could ruin the way you walk or completely ruin your stability. And that means the person suffering cannot even walk. You can see all these symptoms in any patient that has MS, in their vision, in their stability, shaky body part, pain, dizziness, different body parts falling asleep, and you can even have trouble speaking. Some have even suffered from depression and terrible stress because of it. And because of this, the whole disease gets even more complicated. This complicates the situation for doctors as well, because they have to figure out themselves on how to help out their patient. Not all patients are the same, so there's not get better help quick scheme. It's not like diabetes where it's more straightforward. It's kind of rare to find two different people suffering from MS that they have the same exact symptoms. So this is how complicated it is. Before they give any type of prescription, doctors have to make sure how severe it is. The year is 2024 and doctors have not figured out on why a person gets MS. Right now around the world, about 3 million people have MS. This disorder can cause a lot of negative effects, but it's not considered fatal. Of course, a lot of different things could happen that makes it fatal, but the disease itself is not. Even though scientists have not figured out what MS actually is, but they know what it does to the human body. Just like we said, it attacks the nervous system. The MS attacks the myelin part of the nervous system. But what the hell is myelin? If you want the simple answer, myelin is basically the cover on the wires of the neurons. And if your wire has proper protection, nothing happens to it. But the thing is, the MS 
attacks the myelin, destroying the cover on your neurons. And when that gets destroyed, the protection is all gone. But what attacks myelin? This is the thing that makes MS very complicated because scientists and doctors are not 100% sure, but they have a lot of theories. Through recent history, doctors thought it was a virus that's doing this, a virus named Epstein-Barr. They also called this virus EBV. There were other theories, but nowadays, doctors and scientists went back to the original theory that it's the virus called EBV that's doing all the damage. Don't think EBV as a virus like AIDS or like COVID. EBV doesn't negatively affect the human body because 95% of humans have this virus inside their system, but only half a percent of people have MS. After examining the virus itself, they realized that it's not actually the virus's fault because most people are not affected. But why doesn't it affect everyone? And that's why they continued their research specifically on people that actually have MS instead of the virus itself. They wanted to figure out what the virus is doing in the person that has MS, not the EBV virus itself. This is exactly when they realized that it's not 100% EBV's fault. It's actually the immune system. The immune system thinks the virus is a problem and it wants to get rid of it. But unfortunately, your immune system is at fault here. It wants to destroy the virus, but in return, it damages your nervous system. The interesting part is that scientists realize the people that have MS see the EBV virus exactly like the myelin because they have very similar DNA codes. And alongside destroying the virus, they also destroy the myelin that protects the human nervous system. Figuring out 100% on what happens in the person with MS, it's one of the biggest things doctors and scientists have done. Because after decades of researching, they finally figured out on what happens and they can't figure out on how to get rid of it. Scientists have figured out that to help people with MS in short term is to weaken their immune system so they don't attack the myelin of their body. But this is just a band-aid fix. But there is another hopeful message. And that is, scientists have realized that the EBV in the human body, which is in 95% of people, don't affect the body whatsoever. Not negatively, not positively. We know that because 5% of the world doesn't have this. So that's why they're trying to figure out on how to completely make this virus go extinct. Another problem or challenge they face is that this virus is not easy to kill. It's a very large and strong virus and not any old vaccine will get rid of it. But of course, finally, they figured out if they get rid of the EBV virus, they can get rid of MS. So they're trying to figure out on how to create a vaccine. But a vaccine like this is not something that could be made very quickly. It needs years of research and testing before they actually give it to humans. They've been working on this vaccine for about a year now, but they haven't finished it. But on the plus side, they are very positive and they are hopeful that they will fix this issue and maybe, just maybe, they will get rid of MS forever. Thankfully, there is a lot of medications doctors give to people suffering from MS to help them out in a short term. But hopefully, there will be a long-term cure for people suffering with this brutal disease. There's a problem with humans that we truly don't know why it's there and how it actually works. A problem that's called allergies. People can be allergic to anything, allergic to the weather, allergic to cats, nuts, seafood, dogs, and many, many other things. If you want to explain allergy in simple terms, it's basically your immune system making a mistake. Like for example, let's say a person is allergic to shrimp and they grab a shrimp and start eating it. What happens? That person's immune system recognizes that shrimp as a threat 
and it's not a small threat. It actually goes full-blown insane and starts attacking it like it's some form of disease. But in reality, the shrimp is no way a threat. It's actually somewhat healthy for you. But your immune system is making a huge mistake. When this happens in a person that's allergic to something, this is called an allergic response. Anything that's called an allergy, it's basically a person's immune system making a mistake. But if you have any other problem that make it seem like it's an allergy, it's probably not. Like for example, people that cannot consume lactose are not allergic to milk. They're lactose intolerant. That basically means their body cannot digest milk. But let's get back to allergies and how they actually work. You first have to know anything that goes inside our body, including foods, our immune system first has to scan everything to make sure it's all good to go before they pass it through. If it's a threat, they'll have an army attack it. And if it's good to go, they just let it go. Let's give you an example that's very simple. Let's say a person has a nut allergy and they consume some nuts. When the protein of this nut gets consumed inside our body, the immune system sees that protein as a threat. So in simple terms, the immune system gets an army together to destroy these proteins. But in reality, that protein is not the enemy and it's not even bad for the person. It's very healthy actually. This is allergy. If a person is allergic to a type of food, they're usually allergic to the protein of that kind of food, like fish, olives, or other fruits. But why does a person have allergic reactions to proteins of different types of food? It seems like it's something simple and scientists and doctors should figure out quickly. But the thing is, they truly don't know. But they have some theories. But out of all the theories, there is the strongest one, which we'll explain to you right now. There are people allergic to many different things, just like we said with foods, the weather, cats and dogs. But there's also a lot of people that are not allergic to anything. The strongest theory suggests that all the allergies a person experienced started when they were a child. And you really can't catch any new allergies when you're an adult. Like for example, the person that has allergies to peanuts, when they were a child, particles of peanuts entered the system, usually through the skin. And since these particles entered a weird way, like through the skin, the body automatically thought that this was a threat and they destroyed it. That's why sometimes on a child that has an allergic reaction, you see red dots on their skin, and that's actually an allergic response. And if that child's body sees the proteins of these particles of the peanut as a threat, they will pretty much be allergic to peanuts for the rest of their life, because as a child, their immune system will never forget that protein as a threat. And this is a simple way of how an allergy is formed at a very young age. The human immune system has different cells that protect us. You have the T cells and you also have the Th2 cells. In simple terms, the T cells are the responsible ones that think logically. They examine the problem and basically come to a conclusion that if this thing is a threat or not. But the Th2 cells, also called the allergic cells, are very feisty and they want to destroy anything that enters the body and it is the T cells job to tell them to calm down this is not a threat and let it pass through. Usually these two cells should be very equal in amount in a human body but there are some times where the Th2 cell population is much higher than the T cell and when the Th2 cells are highly populated they make a lot of mistakes and there's not enough T cells to tell them to calm down and relax. And that's why new forms of allergic response are formed in that type of body. But this is not normal for people that are allergic to one thing. Scientists say that people that have more Th2 cells in their system than T cells very easily form allergic reactions to different foods, especially to dairy products, meat, eggs, fish, shrimp and wheat but usually people that are allergic to one thing that was formed when they were a child up until now we only talked about allergic response to different foods but there are many other allergic reactions including seasonal allergies 
Being allergic to pollen and debris is much easier than different things because it could very easily enter your systems during a season where there's a lot of pollen in the air and all you have to do is breathe it in and it's already inside your lungs. Just like how a person that's allergic to peanuts sees the peanut as a threat, that body sees the pollen as a threat. But there are levels to this because there is people that get a terrible allergic reaction by eating one peanut then there are people that barely feel anything. They just get a quick itch or their eyes get watery. These are both allergies at a different level. Most people are allergic to pollen and dust mites because these are very common in an environment and you could easily breathe it in at any age. And usually just like any other allergy, you get it when you're a child and it will stay you probably for the rest of your life. Thankfully, these allergies are somewhat mild compared to other ones. You usually get a watery nose, itchy and watery eyes, and even your throat starts itching. And it usually happens only in spring. Scientists say that allergies has grown by a bunch in the last century. And they believe it's because everything is much cleaner and our immune system is getting somewhat lazy. They don't work as hard as before and they make a whole lot of mistakes creating new allergies. Unfortunately, there is no cure for allergies. But fortunately, there are a bunch of medications and drugs you could take that help with different forms of allergies. Allergies to different foods that are much more severe need the help of a doctor. But if you have seasonal allergies, especially things that happen in the spring, there are many medications you could buy over the counter that are very reasonably priced and they actually work very well. You might have seen like a young person that's allergic to cats, they can never be near a cat. But once they get older, maybe past the age of 30, that allergy is gone and they could hang around cats again. The thing is, doctors do not know why that happens. It's very rare that this happens, but it does. And if they figure out how it happens, maybe, just maybe they can figure out how allergies work and maybe they could even find a cure for it. Being allergic to different foods, you can only get help from doctors and we're not gonna recommend anything. But we can recommend preventing allergies to dust mites and pollen. If you have allergies in the spring, you should usually wear a mask when you go outside and that would help you a bunch because it prevents dust and pollen from entering your system. But some people have these seasonal allergies inside their house. That usually means there's pollen and dust inside your house. If you have carpets, it might be dusty, so you should vacuum them, wash them, clean your couch, wash them, and also once in a while, change your bed sheets and your pillow sheets because dust could get stuck in there and enter your system at night. And of course, there are many medications that help with these seasonal allergies. I wish you all the very best.